Coming up next, Frank and Mary in Framingham with your host, Grace O'Donnell and Arthur Bergeron. Today's guest is Donna Murray, Family Caregiver Support Specialist at Bay Path Elder Services. She will provide information about providing support to caregivers to help them continue giving care. Hi, welcome to this episode of Frank and Mary in Framingham. I'm Grace O'Donnell, Director of Elder Services at the Callahan Center. And I'm Art Bergeron. Uh, my day job is as an elder law attorney at Myrick O'Connell, uh, where I do nothing but elder law, which I can do because there are 70 of us with the biggest firm outside of Boston. But the point of this show is not about elder law. It is about my friends, Frank and Mary, whose goal in life is very simple. They wanna live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And in Framingham, that means they wanna stay right here. So the point of this show is to acquaint you, if you can identify with Frank and Mary, with the people you need to know and the programs you need to know about, uh, if you wanna do exactly that, you wanna just stay right here. With me as, as who's the person who started this show is my friend Grace O'Donnell, because she, as the person who runs the Callahan Center, finds all these great people. So Grace, whom do we have today? Hi, Arthur. Our guest today is Donna Murray. She's the Family Caregiver Support Specialist at Bay Path Elder Services. Hi, thank you for having me. So the Family Caregiver Support Program is a statewide program. Bay Path Elder Services is your local uh, aging agency, and I am the Caregiver Support Specialist. I take care of caregivers who are over the age of 60 caring for somebody um, who's, who's older, over 60. I, if you're a caregiver taking care of somebody over the age of 55 who may be able to, who's disabled, I can assist you. And if you're taking care of anybody with Alzheimer's disease. And if you're a grandparent or a kinship caring for somebody under the age of 18, you may be eligible for my program. So my program is set up to make the caregiver the priority. Where would we be without caregivers? They are important and they deserve our attention and, our, and your, our support. So I look at what the caregiver's goals are and what the, their loved one's goals are and try and see what type of barriers they have, what is their greatest stressors and how can I help them with caring for their loved one in a safe place. That's Thank you, Donna. Uh, it's interesting. I've known about this caregiver support program for a long time, but I didn't realize you also provide support to grandparents taking care of their grandchildren. Uh, yes. Do you have an idea of what percentage of the people you're assisting are grandparents in that circumstance? So for, for my area right now, we're very low on assisting grandparents. So we really want to get the word out to grandparents that we're here to support you. So if you're caring for a grandchild and you need some resources, you can contact me. I can help connect you. If you're the guardian or you just have a, a grandchild living with you. I can help connect you to resources, legal services, um, probably maybe even a campership if you need some funds to help with that grandchild. Wow, that's great to know about that. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me a bit more about um, how you assist people. Can you give me some examples of how you've helped caregivers who were having difficulties? So I really try and meet the caregiver where they're at. I try not to overwhelm them. There are a lot of resources today, especially with COVID. There's a lot of virtual resources. So I really try and meet the caregiver where they're at. Um, what is it that you need help with? Do you have some of the basics of caregiving? Do you have a health care proxy in place for the person you're caring for? Do you have a durable power of attorney? Are you guardian? Do you have a backup plan? Are you looking for a team around your care, your, your loved one, your care um, recipient? So I really try and figure out what is it that you're looking for? What is it that had you call me today or did somebody reach out on your behalf? What are your struggles? Yeah. 
I can see where having a backup plan is very important. And I imagine for a lot of people, being in the stress of caregiving, they don't think of that. They think I'm just taking care of this person. It's all on me. And they don't take that moment to pause. Well, what if something happens to you, the caregiver? What will then happen to the person that you are providing care for? So that's terrific that you're able to help them come up with an Mm -hmm. alternative uh, for when that when they're not able to do that, even if it's just a temporary situation. Correct. And I, ha- yeah. and I have to say that the, the, another piece of that, which I think is just crucial, is of course your caregivers are totally in the moment, right? I mean, oh my God, you know, be- before we started this show, I literally got a call from a guy, you know, and his, the, you know, this is the eighty-nine-year-old father and just came out of the hospital. You know, is in a skilled nurse, wants to come home from the skilled nursing facility, but doesn't want to do the things he's supposed to do. And, you know, so he's like in the middle of this and and, and certainly has to deal with that. And you were just talking about those issues, but also needs to be thinking about where is this going from here? This, this, you know, this person is 89, health is probably going to deteriorate. Kind of what's that kind of longer course? So so having somebody like you, who can really kind of look at all of those things, just got to be crucial to a lot of people. Correct. And so you really want to look at who's making the decisions. Is the, um, the older person still able to make decisions for themselves? Are, does a caregiver have to make decisions? Is the healthcare proxy invoked? So we really look at that. And sometimes if the caregiver, if the healthcare proxy has not been invoked and the, their parent or the person they're caring for is still making decisions, it can be very difficult for the caregiver because as a caregiver, everything kind of gets placed onto them. And so we really look at um, how do you set limits? How do you determine what you're capable of doing? And who is the one who needs to face the consequences? Sometimes the, the, the caregiver um, you know, needs to say that uh, this is something that I can't provide. Um, and so who's going to face the consequences? And then how do we build a team around that? In particular with people dealing with dementia, I know there are some particular skill sets that are helpful for people to learn with that. Do you have any um, recommendations off the bat? So I can help somebody with some basic techniques. So if you're dealing with somebody with a dementia, um, it's very important that you talk in a, in a slow calm manner. You're making eye contact with the person. And you're really trying to work on uh, what are their emotions that they're displaying. So, you know, really trying to give some basic techniques on uh, identifying what the emotion that the person's feeling. How would you feel if you if you had this situation going on? And then how would you then divert them onto something that they need to do or, or to a place that they feel safer? You know, you can validate those feelings. I understand you're feeling scared right now. I would too if I was in that situation. But how, so I can help you. I'm here to help you. That's, that's something why I'm here. And, but first let's try and get a glass of water. Let's try and then do something that's an activity that's a little more comforting and soothing. Mm-hmm. If somebody needs more than that, then I direct them uh, to the Alzheimer's Association to, it depends on what type of dementia the person may have. If it's a Lewy body dementia, the Lewy body association is fantastic. Parkinson's association. Um, There's also a company called Sweet Grapes that does Alzheimer's coaching, one-on-one Alzheimer's coaching. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've heard something about comfort animals also sometimes being used to help people who have various forms of dementia. Oh, yes. you have one. So I have a, a little yeah. friend here. <laughs> so this is a comfort, it's an electronic cat. And so she's very soft. She's washable. Uh, she has, a, she purrs. So you can feel some movement inside. Um, if she, you put her down, she will go quiet. Uh, there's also a button on the bottom where you can mute her and just have her moving. So it's quite okay. comforting um, we provide these to caregivers so that they can give it to the person, their loved one, um, especially somebody with a dementia. And it's really comforting. It just gives them a moment of peace and relaxation so the caregiver can then shift their attention. Right. Yeah. And I've, I've heard a lot of studies about how animals, uh, live animals are very comforting. 
But I can imagine in that circumstance, mm-hmm. even one that isn't live, but is looking so lifelike, could be very soothing for people who especially have an affinity for dogs or cats. Yeah, wow, that's, that's terrific. Yeah. And so you don't have to feed it or you don't have to worry about <laughs> vet bills. But we do ask that you put it up high in a high place so nobody trips on it. Yeah. Most importantly, no litter box. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. And there is a dog also. And the, the cat comes in different colors and there's two choices for dogs. Oh, okay. Yep. Oh. Uh, I also understand that you're able to help people who are caregivers for people with various disabilities of any age as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Yes. So if you're an um, older person and you're caring for somebody disabled, again, a lot of it is the advanced directives and the backup planning. You know, do you have, oh, the cats are meowing here. Do, you know, do you have a backup plan? Um, It's very stressful for some elders as they're aging. What's going to happen to, you know, know, my child or this disabled person I'm caring for if I can't care any longer. So we also look at um, what's their income, what's their health insurance, and are there community care programs that we can connect them to so that they're, they're, they're connected to the community? Mm-hmm. Wow. And I suppose that's one of the things that people don't, often don't realize when they're calling you is that a lot of folks will think, are thinking like that you're some kind of a for-profit agency, right? As Correct. opposed to you're, you are their tax dollars at work. You are you know, really there to try to figure out what what these other resources are, and you're there, you're not there to disqualify them, you're there to qualify them, right? You're there to actually figure out how it is that they could really become, you know, that, that they can qualify for these various programs. So you just correct. So I'm not attached to any one program. So if that program's not going to work for you, maybe there's another program I can connect you to. So I try and make sure that I follow um, if you want me to follow. Some people say I can take care from here and I say, okay, or I can help you make those connections and those referrals. And and in the, in the age of COVID, how are you doing all of that? How are you? So so that's been a challenge. Um, A lot of caregivers have been isolated and are providing care alone. Uh, Even now, because they're so high risk that they're worried about um, other people coming into their home. Uh, Thankfully, there's been a lot of virtual support. So I've been able to help them with technology um, or connect them to virtual support. Um, Webinars have come up. There's a lot of training sessions. And so uh, some people have just had to call on a regular basis. You know, I just make that part of my weekly contact is how are you doing and how are you managing? And Donna, do you have options for people who don't have access to the internet? So for instance, if somebody needed some counseling, could they gain that through you just by way of the telephone? So I do connect them to agencies. If they're looking for a therapist or more of a counselor, I will look at what agencies are available. Are there virtual? Are there, you know, can they call in? Um, So we usually, if, if the person has insurance, we look at what their insurance is and what their resources are through their insurance. Uh, If they need technology, I do offer. If they need technology to, to assist them with that, Sometimes the Council on Aging have technology. There are other programs. Mass Match um, has programs. So I try and connect them to a program if that's what their need is. So it's kind of like you do a lot of the linking of people to the various resources that are out there. But what's helpful is they can come to you for sort of a one-stop shop. You know all of the, the range of things that caregivers of any sort really should be tapping into. And so they could come to you and figure this all out at once instead of going through the phone book or doing their own exploring online to find it all. Right, correct. And if I don't know, then I say, I don't know, but I will research it and I will get back to you. And I always try and take one extra step. I don't just say, here's the link because then they're digging around and finding, oh, that was there. Now COVID has stopped it. So I try and make that extra step to make sure that I'm connecting to something that's live. Oh, terrific. That's great to know all of this resources available for people. Do you have any particular examples of some caregivers that you have helped in, you know, in some unusual way that was something out of the ordinary that may not have come up another time for you? Um, 
I, I think one that was very difficult this year was um, somebody with Alzheimer's. I had a son taking care of his mother and she was a high wanderer. So she was actually oh. leaving the home multiple times a day during COVID, uh, was not able to wear a mask. The adult day health center closed down. All the supports closed down. And he spent his entire day trying to figure out how to keep her in the house. So I actually worked with um, the Framingham Council on Aging on, is there a handyman? Can we get somebody in there to help put locks in a different spot on the door so it wouldn't be something visual? Uh, She was pretty resourceful. She could still get through those locks. How do we get a black mat in front of the door so she would think it's a hole? So, and then finally I gave him, I was able to give him a scholarship to find some help in the community to bring some people in that he knew and felt comfortable with to help work with his mother to really try and tire her out during the day. You know, physical activity, cognitive um, activity, games, sorting, folding towels was yeah. extremely important so he could get a break and, you know, shift his attention for a few minutes and then come back to caring for his mother. Wow. Uh, That's so important for people to know there are other resources that they have. They don't have to try to do this all by themselves. Right. And when you're the caregiver in the moment, it's so hard to see beyond what you're dealing with. And that's often just a very stressful situation. So right. it's terrific that there is, I'm sorry, Arthur, it's just, I'm saying it's terrific that there's such a resource as you to help people in these right. circumstances. Yeah. And, and I was just going to say somebody who can provide these, these alternative strategies, you know, because you, it, I think so often I find we, we, you're dealing with folks who are dealing with folks with Alzheimer's and they, they think that there's only one way to deal with this. You know, it's, it's, it's like a teacher who hadn't, it's like a teacher who hadn't gone to college for teaching and therefore, you know, knows the material that they need to teach, but don't know that there are a whole bunch of different strategies for, to deal with it. And they just don't appreciate that that's, that de- dealing with folks with dementia isn't like rocket science. It's, it's having this tremendous amount of, of al- alternatives, right? Mm-hmm. And ideally this, you know, this, this, this set of people that you, who have gone through it before, I guess, This just leads me to a question. Is one of the services that you provide uh, um, connecting people, especially if they're caregiving for something with dementia, to support groups so that they can be kind of like sharing their bad stories with other people, you know, and and, and just being able to figure it out or or appreciating that they're not alone, you know, just appreciating they're not alone. Correct. So support groups are vital. And it's a way of connecting the caregivers to other caregivers so they can hear what's, what they're doing, different strategies, how did they cope with it. Self, um, support groups are a form of self-care. Caregivers need to take care of themselves. They have their own health needs. They have purpose in their life and they have goals for themselves. So it's really important that we empower our caregivers and let them know that there's supports for them, that they're not alone in doing this, and that, you know, there are some resources to help them. Having a team around them and their loved one is so important today. That's great. So, uh, Donna, is there anything that we haven't touched on in terms of the type of supports that you provide to caregivers? Anything? I, I believe we covered it, a lot of it. Um, I just want caregivers to know that when they're taking care of a family member, a loved one, that it's really important for them to interject themselves into the care plan. You, we make plans on how we're gonna care for the person. And then the caregiver is the one who's kind of left holding the bag, trying to implement everything. So I always say, when you're talking to doctors, social workers, nurses, you need to talk about what your needs are. There's two people. So not to just focus on the person that's getting the care, but also what do you need? Tell them, um, can you do what they just said? Uh, Is that something you can't do? Because it's so important that people start seeing the caregiver as a separate person who has value. So, you know, and it's okay. And then it's okay to do that. And it's necessary. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, that's so important that the caregivers do make that known what their needs are so that they can continue safely and emotionally providing the care that the other person needs. So, so, do you, so do you find that that, that you're that the you're asking the caregivers to actually go to the, for instance, the doctor's appointments with the person that you're caring with for or to, because because what you're really talking about is is like a communications issue, right? That you may very well be having folks who are, I guess you were describing it, that they're kind of not part of this loop, that you really need this kind of team. I guess that I keep, I remember hearing someone constantly, you know, talk about the fact, the fact that dementia is like a family disease, you know, it's like, you know, there's one person, it looks like one person has it, but everybody's, everybody's got it. You know, it's like, everybody, right. It's like, it's, it's just touching, it's touching everybody. And, And when you, when you do this outreach, are you, are, are you also outreaching to, like other members of the family in addition to the caregiver, or is that, are you directing them to people who are, I, I'm thinking about a lot of, of the function of a lot of times, geri- what I think of as geriatric care managers, folks who are really kind of getting the entire family involved. But, it, but, I, but, but I know that that's really intensive. I mean, just by family, that's a lot of people. So I didn't know if that's something, something that you direct people to, or if that's something that you're doing. So I can assist family members in having family meetings and talking about how does the caregiver get their needs met? You know, it may be difficult for the caregiver to say, I need help and how I need help. So I definitely can help with communication that way. I mean, some of this has been shut down with COVID. So it may mean I have another family member call me. I really focus on the primary caregiver, but I will always talk with another family member always offer um, advice and recommendations. I don't tell what the previous caregiver may have mentioned, but I just say, what are, your, what are you going through and how can I help you with resources? But a lot of times we don't think about when we make a care plan, who, how it impacts the caregiver. And you have an appointment with the doctor who gives you a list of things to do and says, you need this medication and now this is changing and you need to do this, you need to feed more often. Then the next social worker says, this is what needs to be done. And the caregiver (laughs) is the one that is left holding everything. And I say, well, do you ever tell them that you can do it or you cannot do it? Because they need to hear that. And and they need to understand the impact and say to them, I can't do that. Can you make that call for me? So, you know, really advocate for yourself along with the person you're caring for. Because if you're not there, can that person you're caring for really meet their goals? Yeah. Yeah. So is, do you, I would assume that in the pre-pandemic days, the way in which you were communicating with people was different, right? And then, but, and and so I guess my, but I guess my question is, as a result of the pandemic, you've been doing things differently. How do you anticipate things changing as things open up? Because, you know, once again, increasingly, I'm finding, you know, everybody I know has been vaccinated. Right. Every, you know, the, the higher and higher percentages of people and certainly every, all of my clients. Right. If, if let me put it this way, if they haven't been vaccinated, it's because at this point they decided they didn't want to be vaccinated. Right. So, well, so, some caregivers are younger still, yeah. so they have they're just getting vaccinated. So we, I have to take that into consideration. A very good point. A very good point. But I guess are you admi- imagining that the way that you deliver services will will can will go go back to being more in person? Do you think it'll continue to be online? How do you imagine? Your- I, I see it. I see it as hybrid because some caregivers are high risk and their um, loved one is still very high risk and they may not feel comfortable having someone in the home. Uh, services are open up, but slowly. So adult day health centers may open up, but half time. So I think I'm going to still be in this very hybrid mode. And it really is a struggle trying to find out how to get caregivers um, care, respite, during when adult adult health centers are still closed, workforce is still very limited. Um, The community may be feeling a break in opening up, but for our population, it's still very isolated. So we need to remember that caregivers are isolated, caregivers may be depressed, um, and that we need to really focus on that and acknowledge that. A real challenge, a real challenge. Donna, did you mention that some of the support groups for caregivers are being done online or by Zoom sessions? 
So most of them are still virtual today. A lot of them have closed down. Um, and I, th I believe they're slowly trying to find ways to open up in person. Okay. So slowly they are. Good, good. That's good to know. But, you know, the virtual has really kind of expanded um, because you don't have to look at how do I leave the house for two hours? Who's going to take care of my loved one? So in some ways, it's been very successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gives more flexibility uh, right. to the person and a little less complications to think about uh, in right. terms of um, getting them dressed, getting the car going and all of that. Yeah. Correct. Good to know. And I know for the, just for support groups, I think that's been one of the one of the wonderful things about all of this. And, you know, and obviously there have some, been some terrible things, but one of the wonderful things that you've got, you know, increasingly people are comfortable with doing support groups by Zoom, you know, with talking to each other by Zoom, right? Mm -hmm. And so suddenly the logistics of it become so much easier, right? And getting a, or inviting a professional to talk to you becomes so much easier because they're right. not, you know, you can actually talk to somebody from Boston or from, right? Because they can just kind of zoom in. It's been, it's been really wonderful, especially for the folks that we're dealing with all, you, you, we're all dealing with all the time, people who are otherwise stuck at home, who are really stuck at home. So Correct. It's been terrific. So, so this is all pretty, this has been really exciting. This has been really exciting. So can, can, can you, I, I know one of my jobs is to kind of watch the time and I'm looking, you know, I, I always tell people on these shows, I do comic relief and watch the clock. So, but, 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 but I, I just want to make sure that, that, that people have got all of your contact information and, you, and, we, and we know that, of course, our wonderful friends here at Framingham Access Cable will, will put up all of your contact information. But can you just kind of give us a, you know, like a phone number or a best number to call uh, if somebody wants to get directly to you? So my direct number is 508-573-7329. Bay Pass main number is 508-573-7200. We have an information and referral line, and we also have a caregiving metrowest.org website. Yep, so that's a great website, by the way. A great website. Yes. So Grace, once again, another terrific guest. Donna, we really, really appreciate your coming Thank on. You. I think this is, this is important information, especially in these times. Folks, you know, you've got their contact information. If you're feeling stuck, don't feel stuck. There are people who want to help you. They're not going to charge you. You've paid taxes for just these services. Wonderful people like Donna Merck. And she looks very friendly, you know. So give her a call and um, take care of these things. Grace, thank you very much. Donna, thank you. And we'll look, folks, we'll look forward to seeing you all again on the next installment of Frank and Mary here in Framingham. Thank you.